Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Andrea Ochoa, and I am the Senior Director for Multi-Tier System of Support. And so one of the projects that runs out of my shop is the Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. So you may have seen this referred to as letters. Um, this is all of us. This is a, a, a good team and definitely um, I only lead the project, but these these four ladies are the ones who are doing the real work. They're becoming letters facilitators and so they're becoming really um, content experts and experts in this professional development. Good morning, I'm Zoanne Alvarez and I work in the special education department and I'm going to start off our session this morning. So before we get started, um, I just wanted to remind everybody to make sure that your microphones are muted. Um, also, we are going to have some time at the end for some questions and, and answers. Um, we do have a Padlet available for you to um, put questions there as well. Um, and then we'll look at um, additional follow-up and support um, when we look at the end of the presentation today. So um, our agenda for today is we're really going to discuss the basics of the letters um, professional development here in APS. We're going to cover the compensation and what the uh, professional development timeline looks like. Uh, we're going to take a closer look at materials and what you're going to need um, to complete and move through the le letters professional development. We're going to really look more closely at the tips and tricks, as well as the application to the classroom practice and what it's going to look like for maybe yourselves or the teachers at your school. Um, we're also going to have an opportunity to hear from some of the phase one teachers here in APS um, that have already been a uh, part of the letters pilot. And then finally, we're going to showcase additional resources and support for teachers as they begin their letters journey. So why are we doing letters? So on April 4th, 2019, Governor Lujan Grisham signed into law a bill, Senate Bill 398, um, that had several indicators, um, one of which was that all first grade students be screened for displaying the characteristics of dyslexia. Um, another indicator that was part of this bill is that school districts are required to provide structured literacy professional development um, for elementary administrators and teachers. So who are taking part in this very first um, portion or phase that we're looking at? This is going to be all first grade bilingual education teachers, general education teachers, and special education teachers. All elementary administrators will also have their own learning path with letters, um, as well as reading interventionists. Uh, APS has already registered all participants for this phase. So what um, professional development are we going to be uh, utilizing to meet the requirements of this um, new law? We're as a uh, Andrea said, we are going to participate in language essentials for teachers of reading, spelling, or letters. Um, this is really a comprehensive development, uh, professional development that provides that in-depth instruction in the systems of language, the psychology of reading, um, development, and those instructional practices that are really supported um, by re research. So what we're really talking about here is the science of reading. Um, this learning is relevant and uh, applicable regardless of the curriculum that you're using. This is really just that solid foundation of what we as teachers of reading should have. And so now Andrea is going to talk to us a little bit more uh, about when this is going to take place and look at compensation. Okay, so as was um, referred to earlier, there there is a letters pilot. So we have um, some phase one schools who have participated. That's about four of our elementary schools. Um, the rest of APS elementary schools, so any of the role groups that were mentioned earlier, if you're a first grade teacher, that means that you have students tagged to you and um, first grade students tagged to you. And so there were very specific um, stipulations regarding who I could submit for registering so I have been getting requests um, people wanting to make sure that they get registered and I just want you to know that right now um, only first grade teachers so regardless of your content area first grade teachers and reading intervention reading interventionists could be registered and so um, this will begin March 29th 
2021, and it'll take about a year and a half to complete the entire progression, um, and it will conclude in the fall of 2022. Um, for this spring, which is the you know the most you know impending um, professional development um, that you're going to be doing, or that first grade teachers are going to be doing, um, it's going to be about 12 to 15 independent learning hours. Um, so this includes learning hours in the um, letters book that you're going to be working through, as well as in the um, online modules. And so that's something that that we've learned. Um, through our pilot is that um, it's not a choose your own adventure kind of situation where you only do the book or you only do the online version. You do it all. It's a comprehensive course. Um, and it takes about 12 to 15 hours to do um, over the span of eight weeks. And then during that span of eight weeks, you'll also have two three hour sessions with a letters facilitator, a national letters facilitator. Okay, and so um, I know that you'll have access to, to this um, in the actual PDF version, um, but this is just kind of a quick glance at what the PD timeline looks like. So um, about units one through five, it's going to be eight week units. So you're gonna have a lot more time to complete those. And then the last three units, um, they move at a quicker pace, but the six week um, pace is what is the norm. So right now, um, PED established this so that it could be easier to do during virtual learning and all of the things that um, teachers are having to take on additional to their normal duties. And so that's why they gave a little bit more breathing room with the eight week um, completion time. But you can see there, you're only going to, the first grade teachers are only going to participate in one unit. Now in the spring, they'll do two in the fall, two in the spring, and then they'll rush order that last bit. Um, to finish in December of 2022. So the teacher experience, um, it's eight units. So each unit is about the same as what I described earlier for unit one that will be um, beginning now and at the end of March. So um, 12 to 15 self-paced hours plus six face-to-face hours with the facilitator. All of these are virtual. Um, so it, it comes out to about 19 and a half hours per unit. So over the course of uh, 1.5 years, um, teachers will complete about 156 professional development hours. So it's, it's a big undertaking, but it's really meaningful and it's really going to, to let you understand um, why we should be teaching according to the science of reading and how you can do it. Um, and so it's going to occur two Wednesdays per unit. Um, from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. And the dates are on the previous slide that I showed, but also, like I said, you have access to the PDF that has um, that has the, the whole timeline. Um, so compensation, um, we received from PED sufficient funding to compensate teachers for 10 hours of this 19.5 average hours per unit. So teachers will be paid at their hourly rate, and um, school administrators will work with their teachers to schedule time within the duty day to complete the other hours. Or if your school has ELTP, you can use um, the professional learning time in ELTP to make up for um, those remaining hours. So there's a few ways that schools, and there's other ways as well. A lot of some principals are really creative with how they use their budgets and their schedules. Um, but out of our office, um, from the funding we receive from PED, we can only fund 10 hours at the teacher's um, hourly rate. So this is an example of how you could structure time just regarding the, the payment or the um, timesheet. I always get questions, how do I fill out this timesheet? Well, tell me when you did the work. <laughs> um, but I think people people have become accustomed to, to very um, strict guidelines regarding timesheet submissions. And so this is just an example, right? So um, from March 29th to April 16th, teachers could complete two hours of self-paced work per week, per week for three weeks. And out of those, um, out of those six hours, three hours would be paid off contract. Then they would meet with the facilitator from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. and one hour could be paid off contract. This really depends on your school site because different school sites have different contract dates. Um, 
Uh, from 426 to 521, uh, teachers would complete two and a half hours of self-paced work per week, and five of those hours for those three weeks would be paid off contract. The rest, um, again, the, the principal would work with the teachers on scheduling that time during the contract day. And then the final um, meeting with the facilitator would be on uh, 519 from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Again, um, this would vary, right? So if you have, um, if this is, if 12 to 3 occurs during your contract time, maybe uh, the principal moves that extra 10th hour of pay into um, the other portions. This is just an example, and it would just be kind of a template to help you fill out your timesheets. This is by no means the rule or the law or anything like that, just understanding that as a district, we can only pay for 10 hours, and then the school has to um, figure out how to make the other hours work. All right, so we kind of talked about just a general overview of what those hours could be structured like, but then what we can do from there is um, provide a little guidance, guidance on what that might look like and how to get prepared for that. And so one of the things that we just dropped into a chat is a letters document that kind of helps uh, provide guidance on how to work through letters, especially for this first unit. And so one of the things we wanted to showcase here is this getting started checklist that you can share with your first grade teachers and reading interventionists at your school site to kind of help know when are they fully ready. And so um, some of these things will include getting materials from Voyager Sopress. They're going to be mailed to the teachers. And so there's going to be two uh, teacher's guides that they should be expecting coming in the mail, even though they're only going to engage in the first unit during this springtime. And then from there, teachers are also going to get an email from Voyager Sopress themselves, um, which is the company that hosts letters. And it will have a username and a password for them in order to get into that platform, that online component. Now, for, if for some reason none of your teachers um, if one of your teachers doesn't get their email from Voyager Soap Press, they can contact them directly at the email that's provided on the screen or at the phone number there, and they can help guide you through getting your, use, your username and your password as needed. Um, the dates that are on the screen here, these are the Wednesdays that are going to be coming up this spring for Unit 1, and so we have April 21st and May 19th, where teachers will be engaging in that work with a National Letters Trainer. And then throughout unit one, teachers are going to be expected to kind of look at three students that are in their class, specifically struggling readers. And so on that list there, you'll see what exactly they're going to engage in with these three struggling readers throughout just this first unit. So specifically, a lot is going to be on reflecting on their progress in language and literacy, their oral language development, and some of their writing samples as well. And so once the teachers kind of have these steps figured out, they're going to be ready to engage in that work by March 29th. And so this is what a potential timeline could look like. And this is sparsed out so that way you would meet those two hours or 2.5 hours every single week. And so um, one of the things we're planning on doing, and we're still working out when we're going to do that, but we would like to have a chance to meet with the first grade teachers and kind of get them a kickoff for like 30 minutes just to let them know, you know, what letters is, how we're going to engage in it, just to kind of help be that support and let them know what's available to them and what this experience is going to look like. And then, of course, this is how they can engage in the unit throughout each of these weeks, where if you see the week of the 19th, they're not really engaging in the other session work. They're really just focusing on that facilitator time. So that way um, we're not overloading the teachers with do all of your sessions, do your bridge to practice activities and go to a letters facilitator training that week. So that week's kind of sparsed out to save that time for the um, national letters trainer. And then those last couple of weeks um, from then on, after session four and on, those kind of walk through the remaining sessions of that first unit. It um, parses it out to that 2.5 hours that Andrea was talking about earlier. And the goal is for all of the teachers to finish up with unit one, session eight, before the, seven, the week of the 17th. So then that way they can focus on their, um, their training 
with the National Letters Facilitator. Now, um, right now, when teachers get to the end of their unit, and Rachel's going to talk a little bit about this um, when we go into the online platform component, but by the end of the unit, the teachers are going to need to take an assessment, and they are either going to be given a certificate of mastery or a certificate of completion. And mastery indicates that they have completed um, at least 80% or better on the assessment that was given for that unit. And that's really the goal that we're trying to achieve when, as we go through this professional learning experience. So right now we're hoping that um, teachers can get that unit one certificate of mastery and then um, email, it to, email it to their administrator just to kind of keep track and everything. And it kind of helps keep track of those professional learning hours. Um, that of course may change as we can, as we continually talk with each other, but we're always going to give you the upfront information as, um, as we learn about it. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Rachel, who's going to talk about the materials and the online learning platform. Thanks, Maggie. Um, so what you see here on the screen are the materials that you'll get, um, the letters manuals. I'm going to hold mine up here so you can see the physical copy. Um, so you will get, your teachers will get two of these um, for units one through four, and then the second volume is units five through eight. Um, so that's the reading material that we are talking about that goes along with the online learning platform. So there you'll see a screenshot of that learning platform. It has all of the units um, in order there, and you, you can click the drop down menu to get a list of the sessions within those units. Um, and on the next slide, we're gonna see kind of a more detailed view of how these units are broken down. So units one through four have eight sessions each. After you are halfway through, the sessions, so after session four, is when your teachers will meet with their live um, facilitator. And then they'll complete their final four units, take their end of unit test, and then meet with a facilitator again. So you'll meet, they'll be meeting with a facilitator twice for every unit. Then unit five, units five through eight are structured a little bit differently. They um, only have six sessions rather than eight, but that same structure. They'll complete half of the unit, do a live training, and then finish up the unit with their test and continue on. Um, so after each of the sessions, there's just a little quiz. So there's checkpoints along the way that should help your teachers out as they get to the end of um, the unit test there. So that is what I have to share with you today. And I'm going to pass it on to Tanya to share some tips and tricks of how to make this work. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tanya Yates. I also work in the special education department with Zoe. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the tips and tricks to help you all um, experience success and help our teachers experience success as well. So in our experience, those of us that have already started this journey, we really found that it was most beneficial to read the sessions prior to doing the online work. You do have the choice, so it would depend on your learning style, but we just found that that seemed to work better. So after doing that first getting started activity, that's really when you want to start reading session one of unit one before continuing on in the online platform. And you want to strive to complete those readings and the online work prior to those meeting times, those live meeting times, which has already been um, stated. But this is really going to help make the most of those meeting times with the facilitator because you're going to be building your background knowledge. And you may also have some questions that you're pondering as you're going through this material. And that's a great opportunity for you to discuss that with the facilitator. You can even generally email them um, beforehand, but often the whole group will benefit from that discussion. Um, you usually will receive an email prior to the live meetings. So far, typically these have re we've received one email for the unit with the two links for the two different meetings. But actually, just our last one, it was only one link. So I can't promise that that's how it's going to happen for you all. It looks like maybe it'll just be one link at a time. But just be on the lookout for those emails um, 
besides the link that it has, it will also include important materials that you might need to print out ahead of time, or maybe you need to have ready with you like post-its or scissors or a mirror. So you really wanna try to gather all of that before the, the time of the meeting actually starts. We really encourage you to try to find a system that works for you to help you stay organized with your materials, whether it's a binder or folders, um, possibly with sections for each unit, each session. And you may wanna do this both physically and digitally. Um, we really encourage you to be taking notes as you go through the content in the reading, in the online platform, as well as the live meetings. So you may wanna have like a dedicated notepad for this or perhaps a document that you're um, taking notes on digitally so that you can refer to those notes frequently, especially for those assessments. They come in really handy there. Um, also, throughout this um, online platform, there are times when you are asked to record your reflections in a journal, an online journal. So if you're already doing that on um, a digital platform, you can easily cut and paste. Um, I highly recommend that when you take your pretest, that you note any of the questions that you're really not sure about, and maybe you're kind of taking your best guess, I encourage you to write down that question, as well as the ones that you know you missed. And they will tell you which ones you missed, but they won't tell you the correct answer. So then as you're proceeding through the content, when you come to the end of a session, you can reflect back and think, well, did I answer that question? Did I learn the answer to that question? So that you're more prepared moving forward. Also, throughout this journey, um, as I said, you may need to record notes within the platform. So that's another way that um, you can easily cut and paste those if you're already doing that. And you might find it helpful if you have a colleague that you can collaborate with, um, reflect together, and you know, just kind of like your, your buddy that helps you when you're exercising and you're committed to that um, effort or whatever it might be, if you have someone who can support you along the way and you guys can communicate together, that's excellent for building and enhancing your knowledge. And we're all here for you too. So you can email us and we will gladly um, collaborate with you as well. Regarding the bridge to practice, this is, um, something that really distinguishes letters from a lot of other trainings. All of the participants are asked to consider three students throughout this journey and their learning. And ideally, these are students that you genuinely have some concerns about in terms of their literacy progression. You may be wondering like, what? why isn't this student quite doing as well as I anticipated or something like that? Um, but you don't necessarily know the answers. And in fact, really this process is to help us learn how to better meet the needs of our students effectively and also to identify those needs. Sometimes we know a kid's struggling, but we just can't quite put our finger on, on the reason why. So this is really uh, distinct in the professional development learning in that it stops and asks us to think about these kids in particular. So, Identifying these students that maybe you've already um, brought to the SAT team or might be a great purpose for Bridge to Practice as well. And it's also going to be easier for you if these are students that you work with on a regular basis. Keep in mind that due to our timeline and that we're going to be going over multiple years, it's likely that you're going to have to select new students at the beginning of next year if you're no longer working with the same kids. Um, you may also want to select three new students when you start unit uh, volume two as well, but that's not, you don't necessarily have to, okay? So you're going to want to take time at the end of each session to complete these bridge to practice activities. For this first unit that we're starting just this, at the end of this school year, this is really basically just reflection. But as we move forward, starting in next year, you're gonna have the opportunity to um, administer some assessments that'll help us dig a little deeper for some students and also be very um, purposeful and intentional with lesson planning to um, consider the outcome of those results. So this year, it's mostly just reflection. Next year is a bit more action. 
um, you do want to have a folder for each student that you use in your bridge to practice so that you can record your reflections, collect student data, and, and any other artifacts. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our voices in the field. And first, I'm going to um, introduce Christine Rodriguez. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me OK? Wonderful. It's so good to see some people that I haven't seen in so long. So this is really fun. Um, so they gave us me some questions to go over. I'm going to kind of base it off that. And I'll probably do a little bit of reading and then also just giving you my thoughts as I read along. Um, so the first question was, how's my experience been so far? Uh, my experience has been really great. Um, although I felt I had a lot of effective tools to help my struggling readers, uh, Letters has really given me a wider variety and more specific ways to support my students. Um, I also better understand how the brain learns to read. I don't feel like I got a lot of that, especially going through college. Um, and so I feel like I'm getting that information that I didn't, I didn't know I needed. <laughs> and so it just makes me a more thoughtful teacher now. Um, because of this training, along with the assessment that we're having to complete, which is the, the Teach Me to Read, the Mississippi that we're having to, to give, I, I feel like I can um, pinpoint and implement specific interventions that support and push my students beyond their current level of ability. Like they said, we, we're watching, you know, specific students and it's nice to see the progression of those students that I'm implementing these strategies with. Really, I'm, I'm doing it with all my struggling readers, you know, because it's great stuff. Um, so what are some successes and barriers that I've come to um, or come across? For successes, uh, when implementing strategies, I've learned how I can see, I'm sorry, I've learned that I can see how it is supporting my students' understanding of reading. So um, being really intentional about how you're teaching the letters, how you're showing your face, how you're showing your mouth, like those types of things are, are much more apparent to me and I'm a lot more um, aware of them when I'm teaching my kids. Um, so my students are now more proficient with letters and letter sounds. I'm a first grade teacher, so it's so important for my, my littles. Um, they are improving on blending sounds into words, which is, has always been a struggle for, for my teaching, right? Getting those kids to be able to tap out words and then blend them. That's a tough skill to, for some of them to master. Um, and then understanding the stages that they're in. Um, I love that part of our, our, the manual that they showed you earlier. They show the stages and you can go and say, okay, I know my kids here. It tells you where they're at and then gives you suggested activities of what you can do with them. And I love that. I feel like that's what I need. I need to be able to pinpoint it and then have strategies right off the bat on how I can help those kiddos. Let's see. And it helps me find and plan activities that will help my students grow in a tangible way. Well, the barriers, um, although this is not surprising, remote learning has been the biggest barrier. Many of the strategies are hands-on or need close-up visuals. Um, Tanya uh, mentioned earlier that you need a mirror and little things like that. Like it's, you can only get so close to a uh, little camera there to show how your mouth looks and, you know, the sound even, even when I've been giving the test, it's so hard for the kids to hear the sounds properly. It's tough. It's tough. So that has been my, my biggest barrier. Um, it's, and then, of course, to replicate some of the strategies in an online setting is very difficult. A lot of the strategies have hands-on manipulatives that have them moving tiles around or felt pads around, and it's really hard to replicate that. It's so much better for each student to have their own set versus I'm doing it for them, which is sort of what you have to do online. So, like I said, that is definitely the biggest barrier is just remote learning. <laughs> All right. And so what is something you wished you knew before letters? Um, I still asked, um, I'm sorry, I had still asked students to utilize pictures as a clue for determining unknown words. So it's just something that I thought was good, you know, like if a kid's close on the word, they can use the picture to figure out that word, but it's just not a sustainable strategy. Them knowing the, the letter sounds and understanding the, the English language is so, so much better of a strategy than using the pictures. So that was one that I was like, okay, I gotta toss that one out. So I have now learned that that is not best practice. Um, I wish, I also wish I had the assessment that helped me pinpoint the areas of high need, as well as the letters teacher guide, um, like I said, because I can pinpoint and then go find strategies that are extremely helpful for my students, very specific ones, not just kind of broad, like, 
you know, try this or it's very specific. They have it in little sections where you can find an activity that's going to be perfect for your kiddo. Um, let's see. Uh, what is something that has influenced or changed your practice as a teacher? Um, hopefully this isn't a too controversial, I don't think it will be, but the biggest influence is reconsidering my schedule. Um, I now think that primary teachers or at least K-1 teachers should focus a larger amount of time on reading skills versus comprehension. I still think comprehension is super important. It is, it absolutely is. But honestly, after you go through letters, you're like, I need to be focusing in on these, these reading skills so that they are able to comprehend independently, which is a lot of what I focus in on, on my SAT, right? These, uh, on student assistance team, my students are not able to read the text effectively and independently to be able to comprehend. So if I want them to comprehend, they need to be able to read it. So that's one thing that I think, um, has changed me. I really want to focus more on those reading skills. I definitely still think um, comprehension is important and it still should take up a part of our day, um, but taking more time to ensure students um, get lots of exposure, exposure to reading strategies um, is vital for them to be able to, to comprehend. Uh, so what advice would I give to a first grade teacher that's about to start the process? I think someone already said this. Uh, take lots of notes. Keep track of all the different parts and guides uh, uh, that they model. Um, they give lots of modeling in the, the videos that they show you. Um, they give suggested activities. It is extremely helpful to add tools to my, my teaching belt. Um, I would also say that it is okay to give up strategies that you thought were supporting your struggling students. It's okay to do that. I know um, even when I first started teaching, I came in all gung-ho, learning all these new things. And even some of those things that I thought were just amazing, I have to let go. I have to be okay to let go. And sometimes I think that's hard for us because we just hold some of those things so true to us. So it's okay to get let go of things that, that are no longer best practices. So um, hopefully uh, you got some good information from me. Please feel free. Uh, my, my name's up there. You can probably look me up if you have any questions about what's going on. I'm happy to answer them as well. But that's everything from me. So I will go ahead and mute. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christine. And I'll introduce um, Lawrence. He has also been participating in letters. So good morning, everybody. I, I think I know or have seen a lot of you before. Um, my name is Lawrence Chacon. I'm the Dean of Students at Kirtland, and I've been at Kirtland for, for a long, long time. Um, and I, so I'm kind of I, not as organized as Christine, so I'm not going to go quite. I, I, I'll go a little more off script. Um, and, and just kind of talk about the experience. Um, so if you've been in the district for a while, um, you know, several years ago, we, a, a lot of folks in the district were able to go through some um, core literacy training. So, um, and when I, when I got to experience that, I was like, this is exactly what teachers need. Teacher, you know, the, it's the, it's what you either have forgotten from your college coursework or you maybe never had from your college coursework in, ter in terms of understanding how kids learn to read. Um, and so I was like, this is perfect. And then when the idea of letters came around for our school, you know, I was talking with our administrator about it and I thought, yes, this would be great um, without knowing a whole lot about it, just kind of the little bit of information I could find out. I said, yeah, this is going to, I think this would be beneficial for our teachers. Um, and prior to starting our school, um, got to have a meeting with Tanya and kind of really talk through things. And the, and she described letters perfectly. She said, if you think of like, anything you had with core as like a undergraduate level course on reading letters is like the master doctorate level um and it absolutely is the amount of information um the way it's laid out the the detail and specificity that's in it for teachers um i, I think is invaluable um i think the first grade teachers that get to go through the training when they're done with it will you know their practices will be changed forever just because of not just the instructional strategies and routines um and those things that come along with letters but the um the the reasoning why um there's tons of information just about language um especially in the first you know the first unit it, it, you kind of start off and there's a little bit of feeling of like how does this actually how's this going to help me become a better reading teacher when you're in unit one? 
but all of the foundation of just how language is developed and has been developed really provides that um, setting for everything that happens after unit one. So, um, so I think that kind of gives you a little bit about the course itself. Um, I, uh, one of the suggestions of working collaboratively, um, it, I, I think is a must for your school. We, uh, um, our school's fortunate that um, we had some collaboration time built in, some PLC time with first grade. And what we found is that my working with that grade level, it really has um, evolved into kind of this professional discussion and dialogue around some of the training. Um, the impact on that, I think, for us as a staff and as a grade level is like I get a sense of just up professionalism. Um, you know, we 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 are having um, conversations that are focused truly on the students and their work and and what we know about the way that they that children learn um and so it's kind of up to those conversations um and the same thing just in sat with with sat in general because um, i am the sat chair and so we've really tried to focus on looking at a specific sequence of learning in terms of um in terms of phonetic awareness skills uh, phonemic awareness skills, phonics skills, and kind of look at that sequence to really pinpoint what the next steps of instruction are in terms of our tier two interventions. And so it, it's the, the impact I think on our school has is, is been tremendous. Um, the, I, you know, the, the, the team laid this out very well in terms of kind of what tips and tricks and all of that. Um, uh, we have teachers at our school that do things in different ways. Um, what for me the most effective way to kind of work with the the printed material and then the online course is to each unit is broken into sections and so i do even though you saw the layout of like for the first unit you want to do the first four sections before the the um synchronous learning time like i do it you uh, section by section so i I, I do read section one, then do the online portion of section one. Then I read section two, do the online portion of section two. And just because it like keeps the material nice and compact so that, you know, I can make sure that I've kind of, in my mind, mastered that first section before I move on to the next section. Um, so teachers will figure that out um, as they work and kind of what works for best for them. Um, as a school, we kind of laid it out in a format so that everybody was kind of working at the same pace um, in terms of like in this week, we're working on this. And that was just so that we could work so we could have those collaborative conversations. Um, the final thing that I think I see in working with teachers um, is the impact on their ability to look at the instructional practices and even programs. So we're a school that this year um, our instructional council said we are doing foundations um, and and over the course of many years at, here at Kirtland, um, we've had teachers that have done it. We have kind of were in part of that reads the leads group where we wanted and we want the support for it. But it wasn't a there, there wasn't the commitments from the entire school that this is what we want to do. And one of the things that I um, the teachers who maybe objected to some of the instructional routines or strategies that were in foundations were they they you know they didn't have the understanding as to why that instructional routine was set up the way it is why the practice is so repetitive and um, and now with the letters training our teachers that are um, teaching foundations they start to they're starting to connect kind of the research and background and the way that um, that individuals actually learn to read to those practices. Um, but they're also able to kind of critically look at those things and look at what do we need to add in. Um, and, you know, in a, a lot more phonemic awareness type activities than they did and then they, that are even provided through benchmark activities um, in kindergarten and first grade. But we, you know, so they, they, they're able to kind of look at what we do with a more critical eye in the, in terms of wanting to see how do we make it better for our students. So that's kind of a, a, our experience here um, at Kirtland. And I, if anybody has questions or wants to talk about kind of how we've set things up, I'd be more than happy to, to talk with them. 
thank you to both of you for sharing your experiences. I really appreciate that. Um, on the next slide here, you will see more ways to get support for this. Um, we will address the questions in just a moment, um, but as we've already met Andrea Ochoa, um, she's the Senior Director of MTLSS program, and so this falls under her umbrella. Um, our Phase 1 schools are A. Montoya, Rudolfo Anaya, Kirtland, and Regional Chavez, so you just heard from a couple of those teachers um, who've already begun this journey. Then you have our letters facilitators and coaches. So you've heard from many of us already today, um, but Maggie Carrillo in CNI, myself, Zoanne and Tanya from the special ed department, and then Eileen and Candice from LCE are just beginning this journey, um, but they will also become coaches for this. So you can reach out to any of us, your teachers can reach out to us for support. Um, and then just kind of a breakdown of the departments at the district level that are involved in this. Then on our next slide, there are some resources. Um, so we have been working on these things all year. Um, we've got a training document and all of these are hyperlinked. So if you are in our slide deck, um, please click on those. Um, here is kind of a deeper dive of some of what you can expect um, with an introduction that your teachers can start reading. We have our early literacy hub, which will give you um, information on the dyslexia screener as well as letters um, and some considerations put together from LCE and special education. Um, there's a frequently asked questions document in here which is really helpful. Um, you may find the answers to many of your questions. There is also a link to the letters APS guidance document um, that can help you out with the timeline and some of those important dates. And then we also have the dyslexia screener, the Mr. Owl site um, linked here as well because these initiatives go hand in hand. Um, and then I want to make sure that we get to the second to, oh, I guess we have until 9.15. I'm sorry, we have time. I was here thinking that I had to rush through our questions, but I'm gonna slow down. Um, okay, so on the next slide, Maggie, thank you. Um, so this is a collaboration of multiple departments um, working on this together, that we understand the importance of this program and the value that it has for our teachers. 